بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا So this is going to be inshallah an introductory class to the book of the Shifa of Qadi Ayad inshallah and I thought that um, it might make more sense or it would be maybe more beneficial for many people who have not heard of this book or not heard of the author that we spend some time explaining the importance of this book in Islamic intellectual history, the importance of this book in the lives of day-to-day -day Muslims that have been reading this book since the time it was written, so on and so forth. So today, inshallah, this will be sort of an introduction to the course, and then the next class will actually begin the reading of the book. Off the bat, I want to say that this is, um, you know, this is one of the great books of Islam. And it's an absolute privilege. It's an honor uh, for us to be able to read this book. And I'm almost embarrassed that I hadn't thought about it before. But this is one of the, you know, the, mo the most important books ever written in the history of Islam. And we are very, very fortunate that we have a capable, uh, an accessible English translation to the book. Qadi Ayad <clears throat> hailed from an Andalusian family. He was born in the year 476 of the Hijra, and he died in the year 544. Of course, he hailed from Andalusia, but he, he was born in Morocco. And Qadi Ayad was one of these young, when he was young, was one of these people who was very gifted with access to many of the Islamic sciences. So Qadi Ayad, he had a normal, uh, traditional Islamic Sharia course of study. But it was very quick early on that he is somebody who excelled. So he excelled in the legal sciences he also excelled in hadith. Now, the year 500 of the Hijra is very important because in the year 500 is the year that we typically consider to be the end of the Salaf. And it is also around the time, I mean, plus or minus, you know, few years, of course, but it's also the time that we consider the end of the verification of the hadith. So as you know, we've just concluded the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. And we talked a little bit about the chain of transmission of the hadith. Not so much because in that book, it's not as important as where the hadith is found. But in the very early generations of Islam, you know, right after the passing of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, and so, and then very shortly thereafter, there was an enormous movement, enormous intellectual movement amongst the, the Ummah, amongst the Salaf, to catalog the various hadith. And in cataloging the hadith, the, the Salaf before us, the people before us, they also wanted to catalog the strength of this hadith. Now, the strength of the hadith comes from its chain of transmission. It comes from, I heard this hadith from so-and-so, and this person is reliable. He heard it from so-and-so, and this person is reliable, so on and so forth. And there's a whole science. It's a, its its own discipline that you can study. It's called ilm rijal the science of men, of course, men and women. Uh, but the majority of the hadith uh, transmitters were, were men, but... None of the hadith transmitters that were women were known to be faulty. So when there's a woman in the chain of transmission, it's considered a sound hadith. And as a matter of fact, in one of the main chains of transmission for the entire collection of Bukhari, there is a woman in that chain of transmission. If you'll see above me right here, this white brown book, all these like 40 some volumes, this is an entire encyclopedia of women. Uh, transmitters of hadith. So the year five around the year five hundred, 
this is sort of when that process ended. In other words, there was no hadith after the year 500 of the Islamic calendar in which somebody found a text that had a unique chain of transmission. That's actually not true <laughs> because there, there are. There are latter books, but it's very, very rare. And uh, there'll be a couple of hadith here and there. But academically, when we come to teach the students in the seminary, or when we um, you know, give a public lecture like this, we say and we teach basically around the year 500 is when that ended. Why is this significant? Because this is the time that, that Qadi Ayyad lived. So he lived at the tail end of the process of the verification of the hadith. And he was gifted <clears throat> by being a hafiz of hadith. So he is considered a hadith master, having committed to memory thousands and tens of thousands of hadith and their chains of transmission. So not only, is, not only was Qadi Ayyad a, just, uh, a judge, not only was he a jurist of the, the first kind, you know, within the Maliki Madhab, he is a, a serious figure, but he was an also he was also a master of hadith. And at this time, that was a rare combination. Usually, you know, you're a hadith guy, you're a tafsir guy, or or girl or, or woman, you know, you know what I mean, or you're a you're a you're a legal person. But to have those various combinations, he was also a historian. He wrote, he wrote history. And to have all of those combinations in one person, he's considered one of those people that's a genius and a Renaissance type of scholar. I say this to underscore the importance of his scholarship. So when somebody like Qadi Ayad with this background, this scholarly background, this uh, uh, devotion to mastering the science of hadith writes a book like this which is essentially completely based on hadith then it's something that is rock solid and reliable which is why this book received wide acclaim during his time and it is interesting that of the three documents or the the three um, books that we have the most manuscripts for when when you enter into the world of Islamic manuscripts, which is which is a completely fascinating world, and and there are many many people in the Muslim world working very diligently to try to catalog uh, our intellectual is very very fascinating. But when you enter into that world, the three titles in which we have the most manuscripts after the Qur'an are three, bo three books written by Moroccan scholars, all dedicated to honoring and praising the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, the first of them is the book that we are, inshallah, dedicating our Friday sessions to the book of the Shifa of Qadi Ayyad. The next one is the poem of the Burda, written by al-Busiri, who even though he lived in Egypt, in Alexandria, he was of Moroccan origin. So this was a poem in praise, you know, the famous Burda Sharif. And the compiled salawat and prayers on the Prophet, as known as Dala al al-Khairat, compiled by Imam al-Jazuli, and he died in the year 870. So it's, this is a, a testament to our North African and Moroccan uh, brothers and sisters their dedication and their love of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that this is a a gift that they have gifted the rest of the Muslim Ummah. Sort of the second area that I wanted to discuss with you is I wanted you to understand what this book is about from a macro level. In the early part of Islam in the early generations, uh, in the early centuries. It was the age of verification, what we call a tawfiq. Tawfiq is to verify. And as you know, and as you've heard me say multiple times before, this is one of the unique features of our intellectual history, 
As a matter of fact, the process of verification, the science of verification, not only is the backbone of all of the Islamic sciences, but it is something that we taught the world. It's something that is unique to Islam, that the idea of verifying information in the way that we have verified, this is something that we taught, that we were the first to speak of this in the way that we've done, to the point that, as a matter of fact, it's not just one discipline. I, I said that in the, in the chain of transmission, it's not just really one discipline. There are multiple things that, that go into that, including history um, and the history of cities and things like that. Anyway, in the early generations, the Muslims were concerned with preserving the primary sources of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah. So the same effort that went with the Sahaba um, during the Khilafah of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then the Khilafah of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhum ajma'een to, to verify the Qur'an, to standardize the script of the Qur'an. But the Qur'an is therefore is then passed down generation after generation. And as you know, there are multiple ways of reciting the Qur'an, the recitations, the 10 canonical recitations. But each one of those recitations, what makes it a canonical reg uh, recitation is that each recitation has an unbroken, reliable chain of transmission back from the scholar who cataloged that all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. We also have non-canonical recitations. Those recitations are impermissible for us to use in the prayer. We are not allowed to recite the Qur'an in that way. And we consider them, rather than being recitations of the Qur'an, we consider them to be a type of tafsir or commentary on the Qur'an. But what makes a recitation of the Qur'an valid and not valid? It's verifying. And this verifying comes from the chain of transmission. So the same thing that went into the Qur'an went into the hadith, as I just mentioned. So there was always a concern with verifying the statements of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the sunnah is one of the two sources of our deen. It is the second part of the shahada. One cannot be a Muslim without being in divine unity. And then the finality of the prophecy of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah. So it is, in, it is part of our DNA. It is part of our um, identity that we have a verified Quran and verified statements of the Prophet. Now, many of much of the academic concern of verifying the statements of the prophet والسلام, were done with the purpose of helping to inform our action our orthopraxy our acts of worship our business transactions marriage and divorce crimes and punishment court testimony you know the things that make up our legal system so we take our legal system from the Qur'an and we take it from the Sunnah. And because it deals in the acts of worship, for example, that's stuff that we do every day, it's very important that we have access to what is authenticated hadith, so on and so forth. However, when you come and you look at the hadith, statistically, you find that there are only about 2,000 hadith that are used in all of the books of Islamic law across all of the madhahib. But we, we certainly have more than 2,000 hadith. The texts of hadith, the singular texts of hadith that we have are about 60,000. Those texts many times have multiple chains of transmission. So altogether, you're talking about 100, 150,000 texts of hadith. So 2,000 from 100,000 is nothing. So the vast majority of the hadith the vast majority of the statements of the Prophet وسلم, talk about something else, not conduct, uh, not actions, but moral conduct as it connects to our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we call al-akhlaq, manners, character. And this is the subject matter of tazkiyah. This is the subject matter of ihsan. You know, as we studied the first hadith or the maybe the second hadith, in the collection of Imam al-Nawawi, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Gabriel about ihsan. He was asked about the law, he was asked about belief, and then he was asked about spiritual excellence or ihsan, tazkiyah, 
tasawwuf. Uh, I mean, they all have multiple names. They're all interchangeable. And the Prophet, ﷺ, he said, That you worship God as if you see him, and if you do not know, that at least he sees you. So the vast majority of the Qur'an, there are only about 300 verses of the Qur'an that deal with law. So the vast majority of the verses of the Qur'an, the vast majority of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, deals with conduct. So while parallel to the early concern of the Muslims of cataloging the Qur'an and the Sunnah and authenticating them, so that we have reliable sources of our religion for practice, so on and so forth. There also emerged with that another concern, equally as important, which is being a better person and refining yourself and teaching us how we, you know, conduct and implement the entirety of our faith. However, the hadith are not the only thing associated to the Prophet ﷺ that the Salaf were concerned with. Early on, the Salaf were also concerned with writing and documenting the life of the Prophet ﷺ, what we call a sira, his biography. So from the very early times, you know, <laughs> Ibn Ishaq and then uh, the, the which is lost, but the summary of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, the seat of Ibn Hisham, which is considered the earliest and the first kind of book, it's not the first, but the earliest book that we have till today, you know, with an unbroken chain of transmission back to it. That's one of the great books of Islam as well, the seat of Ibn Hisham. You know, all seerahs are based on that. Now, what, what makes the seerah different than the hadith? Well, it's different is that the seerah seeks to narrate for us the events of the life of the Prophet ﷺ in chronological order from the time he was born ﷺ, to the time he passed in Medina at the age 63 ﷺ. And the concern, of course, we want an accurate story. However, because it it is a history, a chronology, a narration, a narrative of his life, alayhi salatu salam. The threshold for the acceptance of authentic hadith is loosened because there are many aspects to the hadith, uh, to the seerah, rather. There are many aspects to the life of the Prophet that the, the hadith might not be the strongest hadith. But because we're not basing any action on them or any worship on them, we accept them. And that's why when you find the books of Sirah, you find all of these little details in many of the incidents that might not be repeated in other books. So the concern is different. So it's, an, it's a separate genre. Yes, the hadith is based, uh, the Sirah, sorry, the Sirah is based on hadith, of course. And the people that lived with the Prophet that did this, that did that. I mean, it's all hadith based. And all of those, if you look at like Ibn Hisham, which is like I said, the early, the early book, uh, it's all, you know, every section of the book has a chain of transmission and then the incident is cataloged. But like I said, those chains of transmission and those incidences might not be as authentic as the hadith you find in Bukhari and Muslim, for example, or Tirmidhi or Abu Dawood. Because the books of Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, and so on and so forth, those books were compiled with certain conditions for the use of these hadith in the legal sciences. So when you look at a, when you look at the, the canonical collections of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, and Nisa'i, etc., you will find the chapter headings almost identical to the chapter headings in the books of fiqh. So they kind of like go together for that reason. So the seerah is different. And the seerah <coughs> is its own genre. We, we, we taught the seerah before. We have access to those classes. As a matter of fact, we taught it twice. Alhamdulillah, at the mosque. We taught the seerah twice. It's in its entirety. So from the early generation, there was a concern. With, we want to know the life of the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We want to know not only what he said 
as it relates to our devotional practice, but we also want to know how he lived his life, what happened. So that's another genre that emerges. A third concern that emerges is, well, we want to compile proofs of his prophecy. What we call Dala'il al nabuwa How do we know that he was a prophet? What are the proofs that he has? And that's a separate, another genre of literature related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So talking about his use of language, talking about the miracles that happened, talking about some of the foretelling that he had, that he, he spoke about things that then therefore happened multiple times. I mean, to the point where it's impossible that he, maybe you get lucky once or twice, but not every day. So al Bayhaqi has, you know, Dala'il al Nabu and other, there are many, many other scholars that have Dala'il al Nabu, the proofs of the prophet, of prophecy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the later we go, we have other types of writings that relate to the prophet, peace be upon him, himself as a person. So when we say that we follow the Quran and the Sunnah, what we mean by the Sunnah is we follow the statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but we also follow him himself, the person. So therefore, Qadi Ayad wrote this book to explain to us who is the person of the Prophet wasallam. Now, it's written the way all the other books of Islam are written, Quran and Sunnah and explaining. But the purpose of the book is to show us the importance of the person of the Prophet ﷺ, to encourage us and to move us to attach ourselves to the person of Rasulullah ﷺ. So it's not just I'm going to pray this way because the madhab that I follow uses this set of hadith and relies on this set of hadith for the prayer. I'm, yeah, that's what we do. That's how we pray and we make wudu and everything. But then I want to attach myself through love and devotion to the person of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So not only do we have his statements, not only do we have the chronology of his life, his biography, not only do we have proofs of his prophecy, but now we have a book, a volume that explains to us who he was and what he means in our lives. And the rights, therefore, that are owed to him. That's why the book is called well, in, in the English, it's not translated, but Al Shifa Bitarif Hakuk al Mustafa, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The book is called Al Shifa, which means the healing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The healing in knowing the rights of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if we claim that we are Muslims, there are certain rights and obligations we owe Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not just a recommendation. Right? This is something that we owe him. It's an obligation upon us to love him. It's an obligation for us to praise him. It's an obligation for us to honor him. It's an obligation for us to attach ourselves to It's an obligation for us to uh, dissolve ourselves in the law in 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 his love such that his character becomes our character that his speech becomes our speech so on and so forth sallallahu alaihi wasallam after the writing of of this book in the early 500s there emerged another type of genre of writing or two others <laughs> related to the prophet asallam one of them I mentioned earlier, which is prayer books. Prayer books, uh, 
the most famous uh, in the entire Muslim world is the Dala'il al Khairat by Imam al Jazuli, which uh, compiles various salawat on the Prophet والسلام, that are to be read every day in different portions. So the book has eight sections. On Monday, because the Prophet والسلام, was born on Monday, you read two sections the last section of the book and then the first. And then there's a section for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's a little booklet that people keep with them. And they read that portion of that day today, so on and so forth. Sometimes they do it by themselves. And many of the masjid in Morocco, North Africa, they read them together in the masjid. So another thing, but the Dala'il al-Khairat is not the only kind. And certainly Imam al-Jazuli wasn't the only person to write it. There were people before him. There's the famous salawat of uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. Uh, anhu and other, other of the great saints. But people like Imam al-Jazuli, what he did is he, he came up with this idea, well, let's dedicate a portion of salawat that we can read every day. And each portion is, is roughly the same amount of lines and words. And so it takes the same amount of time. And therefore, I have a devotional practice towards Rasulullah every day. So this is another genre. And there are other, like I said, Imam al Jazuli is the easiest, the most accessible, the most popular, the most famous, but there are other ones. Another genre that, that came out is highlighting the special qualities of the Prophet, وسلم, what we call al Khasa'is. There are certain things that the Prophet وسلم, could do, was obligated to do, that does not apply to the rest of us. For example, the Prophet ﷺ had to pray at night qiyam. It was obligation for him, but for us it's a sunnah. So this is considered a khasisa. This is something sp specific to him. The Prophet ﷺ could see behind him, behind, from the back of his head, like he could see in front of him. Well, I mean, obviously we can't do that. So this is some, one of the khasais. The Prophet ﷺ had vision. He could see in some of the star uh, constellations. He could see more stars than the average human being could see. This is one of his uh, special qualities. The Prophet ﷺ was allowed to marry more than four women concurrently. This is a, one of the khasais. It's not, uh, it's not permissible for a, a Muslim men to do that. So on and so forth. So there became another genre. <clears throat> the most famous of them is the khasais al-kubra by Imam al-Siyuti, who died in the year 9-11 of the Hijra, radiallahu anhu. I believe... He has another one called Al Khasa'is Al Sughra, the, the minor book of Khasa'is. I believe that book is also translated. I believe. I don't think the, the first one is. But he compiled you know, over a thousand points that make the Prophet Sassam unique. So we have the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We have the seerah of the Prophet. We have books like the Shifa. The Shifa is not the only book, by the way, that does this. There's another book by Al Qastalani. Uh, uh, that talk about the person of the Prophet ﷺ. Then we have the books of prayer, prayers and devotional words of praise to the Prophet ﷺ. And then we have the books of the Khasais. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the book of Dala'il and Nabuwa, the, the proof of the prophecy. So there are about a half dozen genres of writing all related to Rasulullah Getting more into the book that we have before us. This book is long. It's about 500 plus pages. And of course, when you come and take Arabic sentences and translate them, oftentimes you need more words in the English or the European language or Western language to translate or approximate the word and meaning. The, the Arabic sentence is meaning. So it will take us some time. This is a book that is going to be with us for quite some time, inshallah. But as I said in the beginning, it's one of the great books. And what I mean by that is it is a book that is universally accepted. As a matter of fact, even the, the, the Shia use and quote from this book different sections. It's a book that is universally accepted. It is a book that has many, many, many commentaries on it. Uh, Multi-volume commentaries, four volumes, six volumes, so on and so forth. It is a book 
that people along with the Quran used to use to swear on, you know, when they're going to take an oath to office. It is a book that people will read 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 times throughout their lifetime. In other words, it's a book that's read constantly. It's a book that people will read for somebody who's sick, which is one of the reasons why it's called a shifa. Because by reading this book, you become healed. I mean, of course, it's, it's meant to be a spiritual healing. But it's very common if people are sick, in addition to listening to the Quran, they will have somebody that will read for them the book of the shifa. And it is a book that is read to, with the intention of lifting tribulation. It is a book that is found, uh, if we, we could have a gathering, you know, like when, we, when somebody passes away and we, we give each person a juz or a para of the Quran and everyone reads one, so we, we do a khatm of the Quran, people do that with a book of the shifa. We'll have a gathering and everyone will have their own book and everyone will, will dedicate to reading a chapter. They'll finish reading it and then they'll make dua. So this is this book. What what gives the book this uh, feature is that it's related to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and anything that attaches itself to the Prophet sallam, is lifted and honored. And and that's the whole point of the book is to teach us why that's important. Is to teach us to turn to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a person, and to understand that that he is with us, that he that he intercedes for us, that he makes dua for us, that he is alive in his graves of, as all of the other anbiya are. And then to develop a personal relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then to see in that the beauty and the mercy that was sent to us and to the whole world Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I want us, to, there's a little homework I have for everybody. I want each, first of all, I want us to agree and to adjust our intention that the first intention that we have in, when we, in reading this book is that through reading this book, we intend that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects our community and wards off all harm from our community, you know, the physical mosque and everyone attached to the mosque. So I hope that we can all agree that that's going to be one of our intentions. And I would like each one of you to use this next week to think of two more personal intentions that you have in reading this book in going through this book with me, inshallah, every week. It could be related to your children, related to your parents, related, whatever. But, but I want us to come to this book with that purpose. And that each day, each class that we have, I want to remind you of the, the agreed upon attention, intention, as well as reminding you of your individual intention. And inshallah, through that, you will see the effects of and the power of the words that are in this book, inshallah. Since we have a little bit of time, why don't we conclude by reading the author's introduction, insha'Allah. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala al-Musannifu rahimahullah wa nafa'na bi'alumihi fi al-Dharayni. Ameen. So the author says, Oh Allah, bless Muhammad and his family and grant them peace. Praise be to Allah who is unique in possessing his most splendid name and alone possesses invincible might. There is no final and oh sorry there's one thing I forgot to mention that let's hold off on the reading one thing I forgot to mention I also wanted to mention the translator of this book the translator of this book is Aisha Buley who has just been selected as the Muslim woman of the year in a publication that I actually happen to serve as an editor for which is the Muslim 500 you can uh, access the, the free PDF of the Muslim 500 online. And every year I write um, a survey of the Muslim world. But this year's um, 
this year's woman of the year was 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 Aisha Buley, who translated this book. And I, I, I for anyone who's been buying uh, traditional Islamic books translated in the English language, Aisha Buley's name is going to be in your house. I, I doubt that there's a Muslim family in the English speaking world that doesn't have her name sitting on her on their shelf. Uh, she has translated singularly and, and in conjunction with her husband, Lord, dozens and dozens and dozens of books, including the Muatta of Imam Malik. I remember as a young boy buying that at one of those you know, Muslim conferences and, and you know, Aisha Buley's name is, I grew up having that name in the library, you know, Aisha Buley. So we also uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless uh, Aisha Buley and her family for her effort. And there's a nice little article about her. I, I also forgot to mention something about Qadi Ayad. Qadi Ayad was actually killed. He was, he, he, he was murdered. And he was murdered because there was this dubious figure called Ibn Tumrat uh, who claimed that he was the Mahdi and tried to uh, usurp the government and <clears throat> you know, ended up killing all these innocent people. And he claimed for himself and his followers claimed that he was masoom, that he was infallible. And of course, as Muslims, uh, as Sunni Muslims, we, we do not believe in the infallibility of anyone after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he refused to claim that, so he was shot with arrows, murdered, and buried in an unmarked grave. Of course, Ibn uh, uh, Al-Qadi Ayyad is buried in, in Marrakesh. And he is considered the patron saint of Marrakesh. And his grave is known. But there was in the early years when he was when he was murdered, he was buried in an unmarked grave. But subhanAllah, uh, it was found, it was honored. Uh, and maybe many of you don't even know this name, Ibn Tumrat, but everyone knows the name Qadi Ayyad. And this is one of the things that happen with the people of Bida. Uh, that the Bida, when it emerges you think that it's it's so big and scary and then it just vanishes like that so may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on qadi ayad and may allah ta'ala bless aisha buli for her tremendous effort for bringing this book to our attention okay so going back to the text praise be to allah who is unique in possessing his most splendid name and alone possesses invincible might there is no final end falling short of him no target to aim at beyond him. He is the outwardly manifest without need for the use of imagination and without illusion and the inwardly hidden. Absolutely pure without the bringing about non-existence. He encompasses everything by his mercy and knowledge. He pours out universal blessings on his friends, meaning the saints. He sent a messenger from amongst themselves to both Arabs and non-Arabs, who was the most noble of them, the purest of them in nature and upbringing, the greatest of them in intelligence and forbearance, the most abundant in knowledge and understanding, the strongest in certainty and resolution, the one with the greatest compassion and mercy for them. Allah purified him both in spirit and body and kept him free from all faults and blemishes and bestowed wisdom and judgment on him. By means of him, Allah opened eyes that were blind, hearts that were covered, and ears that were deaf, and he made people believe in him, meaning Allah. Those to whom Allah had allotted a portion of the booty of happiness honored and helped him. Those for whom Allah had written wretchedness rejected him and turned away from his signs. And he quotes from the Quran, whoever is blind in this world is blind in the next. May Allah bless him with blessings that grow and flourishes and his family and companions and grant them peace. Amin. May Allah illuminate my heart and your heart with the lights of certainty. May he show you and me the kindness with which he bestows on his friends, those who fear him, those who he has honored with the hosp hospitality of his absolute purity and whom he has alienated from other creatures through intimacy with him. He has singled them out for gnosis of him and for the vision of some of the marvels of his malakut, which is the angelic realm, and the traces of his power and, and this fills their hearts with delight and leads their intellects into utter confusion, lost in his immensity. <coughs> They make him their sole concern and witness only him in this world and the next. They are blessed by holding, beholding his beauty and majesty and they go backwards and forwards between the traces of his power and the wonders of his immensity. 
They glory in their exclusion, devo exclusive devotion to him and their reliance on him. They are dedicated to the application of his wo words, quoting the Quran, say Allah, and then leave them playing in their plunging. You have repeat, repeatedly asked me to write something which gathers together all that is necessary to acquaint the reader with the true stature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the esteem and respect which is due to him, and with the verdict regarding anyone who does not fulfill what his, his stature demands or who attempts to denigrate his, stat, his superior, supreme status, even by as much as a nail pairing. I have been asked to compile what our forebears and imams have said on this subject, and I will amplify it with verses from the Quran and other examples. No, may Allah ennoble you that you have burdened me with a very difficult task. You have confronted me with a momentous undertaking which fills my heart with trepidation. Writing about this calls for evaluation of the primary sources, examination of secondary sources, and investigation of the depths and details of the science of what is necessary for the Prophet, what should be attributed to him and what is forbidden or permissible in respect of him. And deep knowledge of messengership and prophethood and of love, intimate friendship, and the special qualities of this sublime rank. Here we find vast desert wastes in which, we, in which even sand grouse becomes bewildered and which cannot be traversed and unknown places in which dreams go astray if they are not guided by a way mark of knowledge and a clear eye, slip and slippery slopes where feet falter if they do not rely on success and support from Allah alone. However, I have great hopes of gaining reward and repayment for both me and you in the matter of answering this question by making known the great value and sublime character of the Prophet and clarifying his special qualities. No other creature has ever possessed all these qualities. I will mention the duty that Allah gave him, which is the highest duties, quoting the Quran, so that those who have been given the book would know for certain and those who believe would be increased in their belief. Allah has made it an obligation on those who have been given the book to make it clear to people and not to conceal it, as in the hadith related to me. And here you will see that Qadi Ayyad will narrate the hadith with a full chain of transmission. And he does this dozens and dozens of times in the book, demonstrating his memory and his his vast his his how steeped he is in the science of hadith the hadith narrated to me by abdul walid hisham ibn muhammad ahmed the faqih when i studied with him he said we were told by al hussein ibn muhammad from abu umar al numairi from abu muhammad ibn abdul mu'min from abu abu bakr muhammad ibn bak from sulaiman ibn Ash'ath from Musa ibn Ismail, from Hamad, from Ali ibn al-Hakam, from Ata that Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who is asked about knowledge and conceals it, Allah will bridle him with a bridle of fire on the day of rising. May Allah ta'ala protect us from that. From this reason, I have hastened to find some clear anecdotes with the object of achieving my goal and fulfilling the prescribed duty. I seized upon them quickly because in his life a man's body and mind are occupied with the trials and tribulations of affliction by which he is tested and which very nearly distract him from both obligatory and supererogatory actions and cause him after having the best of forms to revert to the lowest of the low. If Allah desires the best for man, he makes him totally concerned with what will be praised tomorrow in the next world and not censured. On that day, there will only be the radiance of bliss and the punishment of Jahim. Therefore, a man must mind his own business, look to the salvation of his own soul, seek to increase the numbers of his right actions and acquire useful knowledge for his own and other people's benefit. Allah is the one who mends our broken hearts, forgives the immensity of our wrong actions, lets us make all our preparations for our return to him, gives us many reasons for doing things that will save us and brings us near to him and bestows his favor of mercy on us. So having made the intention to proceed with the task, I planned out the chapters, organized the material, and set about putting it together. I have called it Al-Shifa' Bitarif Hukuq Al-Mustafa, healing by the recognition of the rights of the chosen one. He actually goes to enumerate the table of contents, but <clears throat> there are four sections to the book. I'm just going to read for you the four sections. You can read the subsections on your own. The first section of the book, or in Aisha's translation, she calls it part. 
Part one is Allah's great estimation and the worth of his prophet expressed in both word and action. So this part will talk about the greatness of the prophet Part two, concerning the rights with which people owe the Prophet ﷺ, what is owed to him from us as his followers. Part three, what is necessary for the Prophet and what is impossible for him, what is permitted for him, what is forbidden for him, what is valid in those human matters which can be ascribed to him. This is a very typical way that we speak about the Prophet ﷺ when we study ilm kalam when we study theology. We, we do the same thing for Allah, what is necessary for God, what is impossible for God, what is possible for God, etc. So here, this is the discussion of those things. And then the last part of the book, which is really heavy, is the judgment concerning those who think the Prophet ﷺ imperfect or curse him. Now, in some circles of knowledge, teachers will not read the last part of the book because of its enormity. The first time I taught this book, that's what I followed. But I think in the day and age in which we live, especially in large parts of the Muslim world, in which there are these quote-unquote apostasy laws and people are considered uh, or people are attacked because they are said to have cursed the Prophet وسلم, I think it's important that we read that so I will do my best to, to read that with you to be honest to the book but to be maybe more diligent in commenting on it so we can understand it these are the four parts of the book as I said this book will take us a long time to finish and I hope that we I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the stamina and the tawfiq to complete it, to reward us. And by our reading of this book, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect our beloved community, our masjid, its projects, its children, its elders. Have mercy on our deceased. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? Somebody asked, where did uh, Qadi Ayad studied? He studied in, <coughs> uh, I believe it was a septa uh, in, in, Mor in Morocco. And uh, he, uh, where, where he, I think he later became a judge. Well, he studied the normal way in the, in the various circles of learning with the well-known scholars of hadith, of language, or memorizing the Quran, studying the Maliki madhab. He's a Maliki. Um, and... Uh, What's interesting about the book is that uh, there's a commentary by Mullah Ali Qari. Mullah Ali Qari, of course, is a Hanafi. Um, so it's, it's a non-Madhab specific book. It's just something that uh, applies to all of us. While I have everyone's attention i do want to mention one thing um next friday we won't have class because i'm actually flying back on that day i had a a problem with um you don't need to know why but anyway usually i avoid flying on friday so i can keep the class as you know but there's something happened and i was unable to do that so next friday there will be no class and then the following friday we'll resume in the masjid and on zoom of course uh, with the book um, I, I provided a PDF of the book. I found it. I, I think that link was sent out. If you want to buy the book, it's, you know, it's a book book. I prefer people have the actual book because <clears throat> this is something that, um, you know, you want to highlight, you want to take notes. And I hope and I pray that after we read this book, this is something that everyone on their own will try. Maybe once a year, they'll read it or once every five years, they'll read it another time on their own so this is a book that you're going to want to go through over and over again inshallah wow no questions did i bore everyone no fantastic thank you very much Alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. okay.
Oh, oh actually. Uh, you don't have to pre-read, but I don't know how many pages. Um, to be honest, I find reading uh, out loud exhausting. So I don't know how many, but it's a long book. So I don't want I don't want the book to take five years. So let's see how many pages we get through next class. And then I can tell you roughly how many pages um, to read. I forgot to mention something important. Sorry, it's the middle of the night, so a few <laughs> a few things <laughs> slipped my mind. Um, there, there, there's a, a famous uh, uh, scholar, a Moroccan scholar, who wrote a book about this book. And I, in preparing for the class, I read it last week. is you know very very interesting. He said something fascinating that I actually didn't believe, so I had to look it up. But when Napoleon invaded Egypt in the late 1700s, there was a famous Egyptian uh, Azhari scholar. His name was Abdurrahman al-Jabarti. And Abdurrahman al-Jabarti, he wrote this massive four-volume chronicle uh, of th th that episode. Um, and, and he was an eyewitness. And al-Jabarti says in his book, <clears throat> when the French came to, to Egypt and invaded Egypt, they made their way, you know, of course they came down from the Delta and then they ended up in Cairo. And as you guys know that when Napoleon came, he brought with him engineers and he brought with him scientists and he produced a, um, a massive, I think like 10 or 12 volume book called The Description of Egypt. And uh, actually I was, one of the things that I totally geeked out when I was at Princeton is that we have an original copy of that at Princeton and they, they put it on display once and I, I got to see it. If anyone wants to give me a gift, you can buy that. I think it's only about a million dollars. I saw it in one of the auction houses, the entire original document. <laughs> you can buy me that as a gift. Anyway, Al-Jabarti said that when Napoleon came, all of those scientists and all of those engineers, they, they, they set up shop in, in this local middle downtown area. And they had all of these scientific equipment and experiments, and they were like taking drawings, and and the Egyptians were free to come and see it. So Jabarti said, I went and I saw it, and I noticed that they had many of our books there. They had the Quran, and one of the things that they said is they said he they had the Shifa of Qadi Ayad, and they referred to it as a Shifa al Sharif. So Al-Jabarti doesn't indicate if the book was translated into French. Some of the Moroccan scholars seem to think that that's an indication that the book was translated into French. But what it does mean is it does mean is that that's how well known the book was, that even you know, the French uh, in the 1700s had known about that. They, uh, he said they also had uh, the Burda uh, of Imam Busiri uh, as well. And other books that you know he mentioned in other subjects, but this book was was that's one of the the oddest things that I found. Okay, Alhamdulillah. So uh, 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 we'll skip next Friday, and then the Friday after we'll resume. I apologize for that. Um, stay safe, everyone. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافرون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله